It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show, recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely... Uh, uh, what Where are, are we? Uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was trying to think of another adjective. I always use lovely, right? Uh, this is a show where we talk about comics, making comics, drawing comics, writing comics, designing comics, thumbnailing, and then the lifestyle of a cartoonist, all the stuff that goes into this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. And uh, happy holidays, everybody. It's the end of 2013, and the holidays are upon us. And I'm joined by the perfect, perfect roundtable for a discussion about comics for the holidays. And let's start with the reigning uh, regis of book advisory, <laughs> of book-talking comics, Sharon Iverson. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Can you pile it on anymore? Well, that's what I do. <laughs> but but it, yeah. you you do really really good book talks. Oh, thank you. I think you. the record will show. Thank you. you know, people can go back. Okay. But uh, Sharon Iverson of comics.adl.org, good to have you back. My for pleasure. A whole episode. A whole episode. Ah, excited about this one. And then uh, even more excitement. I will turn to our Skype guests this this time. Uh, Dave Roman and Raina Telgemeier. We love you, Sharon. <laughs> well, you love, well, same goes your way. <laughs> <laughs> and we're uh, live from the North Pole today. Apparently. Conveniently. Uh, <laughs> everybody's wearing their holiday sweaters. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm supposed to make a mention of the fact that I, yeah, Dave talked me into wearing a holiday sweater for this one, and I broke out my... Um, oh, like, can we see, you see get, it? Like, yeah. behind the I mic? I can move yeah. my mic. My, uh, <laughs> given to me now by is Alpha that all Triumph. knitted like the logo the Autobots logo that you're wearing it is, is knitted it hand knitted or is it like a patch it is hand knitted into the sweater nice uh, so for the folks who are listening to the audio I'm wearing a sweater with an Autobot symbol on it that my uh, that my grandmother made for me on behalf of my wife who was then my fiance uh, and that's the kind of woman you marry so so your, so your fiance went to your grandmother and said make this for me like she put in the request Yes, with, cool. with, with <laughs> behind my back, and she and, and if you know anything about knitting, like it's it's all on a grid based system, right? Like you can't just like take a photograph and just like oh I'll just knit that. You have to like put it on a graph. So she had to bring up graph paper, draw the Autobot symbol on it, and then which is not easy to draw by the way. No, not terribly. Especially there's a lot of angles on it, right? Uh, I think the Decepticon symbol would be even harder, but there's a lot of angles on this, and it's actually like spot on accurate. And I was very excited to get it, and I don't get to wear it often, so. Go, uh, Grandma. Oh, Grandma. Oh, Grandma Fitzmorris. I say so, go, Grandma. Oh. <laughs> go, go, Grandmas. That, that's, that's a pretty good holiday gift, actually, is a Transformers sweater. But, okay, so Dave Marina, I've come from the North Pole, of uh, also known as Astoria, New York. Uh, <laughs> good to have you guys back. For those, who, who doesn't know who you guys are who watches this show by now? But Dave Roman, who did a book called Astronaut Academy. Uh, two volumes, Astronaut Academy, Zero Gravity, and Astronaut Academy Reentry. Raina does this little book called, uh, did this little book called Smile, another little book called Drama. Yeah, I can hold it up for the camera, uh, which people, if you haven't read this, oh my gosh, what is wrong with you? This would be one of the holiday <laughs> picks. No, I'm serious. This is, this is a, a, a very, very good book. I, I, I was talking with um, Zach Gialongo on a recent episode of Comics Are Great, and we were talking about um, when The Babysitter's Club came out which Raina also did uh, and I was very excited about it both because I was excited for you Raina because I knew what it meant to you but also excited about what it meant for comics like this was the beginning of something really cool for comics and I was talking with some friends adult friends and they're like you're reading Babysitter's Club and I was telling this to Zach and Zach's like well you should have said no I'm reading a really cool comic and I'm like yeah that, that would have been a good response <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, so, okay, graphic novelists, people who love Christmas and uh, the holidays, and we're going to talk this episode about, uh, you know, people are wondering, what am I going to get for my friends and loved ones for the holidays this year? What kind of gifts should I get them? And I think some great gifts would be getting them some comics and graphic novels, and that's what we're going to cover. What ones would be good ones to get for people in your life, and particularly... I'm interested in ones that'd be good gifts for people who aren't necessarily comics readers because there are a lot in my life and uh, I always try to get some comics that will hopefully turn them over to our side or whatnot. But yeah, can I just share an anecdote that yes, I, I did a school I did a school visit in New York City yesterday and a kid one of the questions that they wanted to or one of the things they wanted to share with me was that they had an uncle that they referred to as their crazy uncle <laughs> who bought them a graphic novel 
for Christmas every year. And they just, she just sort of has like, yeah, I've got that one uncle who gets me a graphic novel every year. <laughs> and in my head, I'm thinking I would be that uncle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, too, get certain people a graphic novel every year, <laughs> force-feeding them. The <laughs> yeah, actually, now I think about it, it's my nieces and nephews that I do this for. So, yeah, I'm the crazy uncle, too. Uh, let's all be crazy uncles this and, and aunts this uh, holiday season. <laughs> uh, but before, can, we, can we warm up first, though, by talking about snowmen, Dave? Because this... <laughs> Well, that's... I'm a little caught off guard by this. <laughs> I, I didn't prep you for this, but it's like, I, as I was typing up my notes, like, okay, what are we going to talk about in the show uh, besides book recommendations? Uh, few people I have ever met love the holidays as much as you two do. Uh, lots of people love the holidays, but I mean, you guys like really make make it into something special. And uh, you're like the Fezziwigs. That, that's, that's how I think <laughs> of you guys now. Uh, so, but it, when we were at ALA... Was it two years ago now? I remember you saying, almost as like a gut reaction, you're talking about how much you love Christmas, and you said, I just love snowmen. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we were having breakfast with Dan Santet, who turned to you, and he said, like, dude, you can't consider yourself a cynic if you say, I love snowmen, out loud like that. Right, uh, yeah. So, I remember feeling defeated. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was trying so hard to convince you guys what a pessimist I was. <laughs> <laughs> but then he follows it up with, I love snowmen. So, okay, I like snowmen too, but I, I, I've never exclaimed <laughs> that I love snowmen. So what is it about snowmen? Can you pin it down? Why you like them so much? I No, because of course it's just a, a, a guttural reaction. Um, but I think visually they look great most of the time. Um, you know, they're very, they're very cartoony. They're made up of circles. They have not dots un, for eyes. Not unlike Mickey Mouse, right? The same appealing shapes that make up a great cartoon character make up a snowman. They're just like combinations of circles. Um, and then from a story standpoint, the idea of something inanimate that gets brought to life uh, by usually magical circumstances is very appealing to me. And then the sort of the drama that comes with a snowman of like, they want to be real, but they're clearly, you know, like a makeshift kind of thing. And there's something always a little off about them. Um, so, yeah, so I love Frosty and all those stories. Um, and I just love, you know, the com there's so many great commercials where like, oh, the snowman comes in from the cold to have a bowl of soup and then you melt into a kid. You know, you know that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh, Aiden, even like super recently, like, and at first I was like, oh, I don't know if I like the design of that snowman. He looks a little, finally there's a snowman that Dave doesn't like. And then I was completely wrong. Um, I saw the movie Frozen and there's a great snowman character in that that is super, super endearing. So Fro and very hilarious. Frozen is good then. I love Frozen. Yeah, it is yeah. good. Especially if you love Disney, like classic, like not well, classic Disney, but Disney and it's like full on Howard Ashman, like Broadway mode it feels like the complete uh ancestor to beauty and the beast and the little mermaid where the musical numbers are really driving the story forward oh and they're not just music like, well, in this a song it's like pushing the story forward with the songs um and the, the guy who wrote the music is the uh co-writer of of book of mormon um and, and avenue q and he co-wrote bobby lopez uh, yeah avenue q which is one of my favorite musicals and as I was saying to Jersey Off Air, I've never built a snowman before. Um, <laughs> I didn't see snow until I was in my 20s because it doesn't snow in San Francisco. Of course, now it snows in San Francisco, apparently, but I never saw it happen. Wow. And then I moved to New York and I lived in apartment buildings. So if we got an inch of snow, if we were lucky, there wasn't really like a place to go to build one. And um, now I think snow is too cold to want to play in it. So <laughs> now that we have a little, like we have technically a little tiny front yard that we could build a snowman in if we wanted to. But now when it snows, I'm like, okay, time to put my pajamas on and get back in bed. <laughs> Can I just say one thing I like about snow is that, and this, is, this will prove me to be a super positive person, <laughs> is that I love the idea that it, like, it snows, this thing comes from the sky, and instantly people are like, arts and crafts. Instantly, people are like, let's do something creative. Let's start building things. Let's start making snow angels. Let's, let's, suddenly, everybody becomes artists and creative people once it snows. And I think that's really fun. That is a beautiful idea, Dave. You are not a cynic. There is no way. <laughs> not, not even close. You, you put on a good act, but no. Uh, I'm battling my inner. inner <laughs> my, my, I, my heart made of ice. <laughs> oh, so you're like, uh, the, what, was it? what was it? Winter Warlock? 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we, that, we can talk about Christmas specials later on. Well, actually, I was say, listen to the Saturday Supercasts where we go into all the Christmas specials in depth. That's right. Uh, you can go to saturdaysupercast.tumblr.com is where they're, they're currently residing. And Dave and I did a lot of discussions on some Rankin Bass Christmas specials. Uh, Particularly, I think I think Santa Claus is coming to town is one of the big ones. Well, that we no, we haven't done that one, have what? we? What? Oh, no, we, we did. Uh, at least we did the Life and Adventures of Santa Claus. That's right. Which highly recommended to everyone. Uh, we did Christmas in July, and we did. Is that it? I think those are the only two that we did. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, but there are some great episodes with Sean Robert and, oh, and Kim uh, Cross, Kim Cross where you right. guys go into Year Without a Santa Claus, which is another really great one. Yeah, that's my favorite. Uh, Craig Sheagle's in the chat room asking, what about Michael Keaton and Jack Frost? <laughs> I've never seen it. <laughs> you know, I, I never saw that. I probably would find it appealing now in retrospect, but it's something about it kind of scared me. <laughs> Greg Siegel, by the way, is the host of the Stuff Said Show, which is one of the best comics podcasts on the web. Uh, Stuff Said StuffSaidShow dot com. Okay, so now let's get to talking about the wi- the, the the list. Uh, Dave, you put together a video. I don't know if Matt wants to pull it up while we preface this with like some of the books that we picked. Um, but you put together a video of the different books that we're that we're going to talk about. Who wants to start with? Uh, let, me, let me start by asking Sharon. Um, when you're doing a book talk, mm-hmm. you're trying to sell somebody on this thing, right? What's your thinking process? How do you teach, teach me to be able to sell somebody on a book? So when I go up to somebody with Astronaut Academy reentry, and I say, this is why you need to read this book, what's your thinking process in setting up that sale? I just think, what, what is it that really grabbed me about the book? Uh-huh. And it's kind of weird, but I think whatever you really engage with in that book and pitch it is really going to hopefully hook some other people into it. So, so it's what you emotionally respond to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so well, does it although make... devil's advocate, I'd like just just to say that I think one of the most important things about when you're getting uh, books or something personal like that as a gift is to to step out of yourself a little bit because I think sometimes we have this tendency to say I love this book, therefore everyone will oh, love sure. this book. Yeah. And I think certainly with readers advisory and with gift giving especially, um, you don't want to fumble out the gate by giving them like the wrong book for the wrong person. Um, so you should, you know, try to think a little bit like about that. Like I know for sure that like Astronaut Academy is not the perfect gift for all kids, but if you like video games, if you like cute things, if you like, you know, uh, scatological humor and things, you know, you, you, that's something for you. But if you want <laughs> something sincere, something personal, you might want to turn it over to, you know, a book by Raina, like Smile or Drama. Which has no scatological humor whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't have scatological. I know you right have right. one well, toilet joke. Yeah, there's like a in toilet all of the series. There's but... one panel where he's sitting on a toilet, and that's it's really a non moment. No, no, yeah, and it, it, for laughs, really. it, oh, it, it, it appealed to the fifth grader in me, and and there's like a toilet paper joke in here where they're like oh, right, shopping for. Yeah, but the toilet but, paper joke. They're buying toilet paper at the store. Oh, yeah. There's a toilet paper called Bum Equipment. Bum Equipment. That's right. (laughs) But I wouldn't call that Sarah Silverman humor by any means, right? So, uh, okay. So, who wants to start? Sharon, do you want to start with one of your picks? I have been reading like mad, and you're right, Dave. Um, I've been choosing books for delivery soon to um, our local... Youth County Detention Center, and I do look for books that I think are going to hit all sorts of interest areas, so you're absolutely right. Um, but I will, t- I will just go with my gut and tell you this one, Monster on the Hill, um, I jumped at it because it looks like a Bill Peet book. And Bill Peet was a worker, well, drawer, artist with Disney at one time, but he eventually went to the career of his choice, which was to write children's books. And uh, Monster on the Hill is a really cool story about um, a world where people in the different villages have their uh, resident monster who on occasion has to run through the village and wreak havoc and scare the bejeebies out of them. And um, there happens to be one village that has a monster. His name is Raymond. And Raymond just doesn't have what all the other monsters have. He just doesn't have that terror thing. He is depicted on the cover. And um, 
It's a story about how an old scientist who's been kicked out of his laboratory for some not so good deed and a young newspaper boy try to rescue um, Raymond and bring him back to be the awesome monster. But while they are off uh, away from the village, they open up the village to a real monster that could wreak not only havoc, but death. Oh my. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this and, and this You is see what I'm saying about her book talks, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and um I, I would be very remiss. The creator of this book is Rob Harrell. And it's my first time to read anything by him. Um, I found it totally delightful, exciting. The character development was really awesome. And of course, I love um, the illustrations, probably because they make me think of the old Bill Pete characters that used to be. Who's, who's this for? Who would you get this for? Um, well, heck, I'd get it for, you know, it's in our adult collection. I really kind of think it's more for kids, but... Um, I definitely would get it for a boy, mm. um, but but a girl, any any kind of kid who loves adventure, excitement, turn those pages. I can't wait to find out what's going to happen next, kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, somebody who roots for the underdog, because there's definitely that element in this book. Okay. Yeah. So monster, monster on the, on the hill, on the hill, and that'll be linked in the show notes. Uh, Dave, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, I have found that for a lot of people who fall in love with comics, usually start with licensed comics, comics based on TV shows, cartoons. My first comics were the G.I. Joe and Transformer comics, and I remember uh, like the whole Star Comics line being very appealing to me before I even knew I liked comics because I was reading them just because I was a fan of uh, the specific property. So the first book that I would recommend to a lot of people, and I'm definitely going to give this to a couple people as a gift, um, are the Adventure Time comics uh, published by Boom. There's a lot of great ones that they've uh, published over the past couple of years. In general, they're really fun, um, but there's one specifically uh, that's just been uh, published as a graphic novel uh, that's Fiona and Cake, which if you guys are fans of Adventure Time, you'll know that there are two episodes uh, that Natasha Allegri, who is an amazing artist, uh, was sort of responsible for taking the Adventure Time characters and gender swapping them, turning them into a uh, girl hero, uh, into a girl hero, and instead of a dog, it's a cat. And those two episodes are probably two of the most amazing episodes of the show. And I know that if you're a real big fan of those episodes, you'd want to see more of that. Um, so the comic provides that, and it's and it is uh, written and drawn by Natasha, so it completely has her sensibility. And some people might know her now from her own cartoon series called Bee and Puppy Cat, which has become a big web uh, Kickstarter success. But um, besides, you know, she's someone who, you know, she works in animation, but she kind of comes from the comics world, and her comic storytelling is fantastic. All the visuals are really great. It's a really funny story. Um, there are pages that I literally, like, just, like, fell out of my seat. I was just laughing so hard. Um, and I think that, you know, this will show the sort of same thing that made me fall in love with licensed comics is that, Sometimes you go to the comics because they're doing stuff that they don't have time for in the show and they can sort of pull off different types of jokes. Um, she really plays to the comic strength. Um, so Adventure Time with Fiona and Cake, the first volume, is out uh, from Boom or Kaboom, which is their kids' comics line. Is this? Um, would you just specifically recommend this for children? I would. Well, I'm... Adventure Time is a is a kid show that really does sort of spill out into the adult world. There tends to be a lot of adults who do like it. I would definitely give it to a kid for sure um, because those that's the, the biggest fans are certainly kids. Um, and what's great is that it's it's a girl hero who um, is really a fun girl hero that people will definitely want to root behind. And we know obviously the comics world could always use more of that. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm actually just gonna quickly segue. <laughs> into my next uh, recommendation just because it's sort of similar. This, the, the sensibility is very similar to Adventure Time um, and specifically the Fiona and Cake episodes. Um, there's a book called The Radically Awesome Adventures of the Animal Princess. I'm holding it up there. Um, 
And it is drawn and written and drawn by Pranas, who we've mentioned Dinosaurs on the show before. Dinosaurs in space, yeah. And we still don't know how to pronounce his last name exactly. <laughs> it looks like now Najokaitis, Najokaitis. I'm sure it's wrong, and I'm, I but I trust me that this is a book you definitely want to check out if you like really funny, uh, whimsical stream of consciousness, kind of like the kid humor that I'm known for. Mm. Um, and the type of stuff you'd see on Adventure Time and Cartoon Network, this is a book you definitely want to check out. And in point of fact, all of the books by Blue Apple's Balloon Tunes series are really, really great books to get for young kids, early readers. They're sort of like this in-between of like early reader books and comics. Um, but the ones drawn by Pranas are just above and beyond some of the best comics, I think, being published. You're getting an enthusiastic nod from Sharon on that. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and from me. I mean, that guy, and, and if you can ever find him at, like, conventions, like at TCAF or at uh, places like SPX, he also makes the most amazing mini-comics. Yeah, I'd say he is the best mini-comics artist out there for sure um, because the books are just amazing pieces of craft um, in addition to being great stories. Um, I should just say, like, so the setup for this comic his comics all have these great premises. We mentioned dinosaurs in space, which is just like one of those simple, why didn't I think of that kind of ideas. Um, the animal princess is basically a princess who becomes a superhero, and depending on what animal pajamas she wears, she sort of impact, she gets the powers of that animal. So when she's wearing a raccoon pajama, she has the powers of a raccoon. When she has a monkey pajama, she can climb up walls like a monkey. If she's got... Um, sort of like uh, fish pajamas. She can like swim underwater. It's sort of like the third Super Mario Brothers game, Super Mario say. Brothers Three, where That's he puts kind on of like Battling Boy. He puts on the thing. Yeah, yeah Battling Boy uh, by First Second, um, and Paul Pope has a little bit of that too. Um, with in that case, it's like magical T-shirts, but this is magical pajamas. Which is a super genius idea. Oh, that's so good, so good. Oh, and you're right. It's one of those things where it's like, why didn't I think of that? Ah. Oh, and it, and and what's great about it is like it's not just a great idea. He executes it perfectly. It yeah. really does all the things you want it to do, and it's really funny. Ah, oh, so cool. Uh, Reina, what do you got? All right. Uh, for to start with, I'm going to talk about Will and Wit, which is by Laura Lee Gulledge, and um. Will is short for Wilhelmina, who's a girl, I think she's in high school, and she is an artist. She's really into light design, so she gets into sort of the theater crowd in her school. And uh, she's also afraid of the dark, so um, anything that she can do to make light to uh, keep herself away from darkness is very important to her. And Wit is a hurricane, Hurricane Whitney, which um, comes to her town and knocks out the power. So it's kind of about this girl's struggle with uh, her fears and something about her past that she's hiding from. And it's a group of kids that get together and make like light and theater installations. And um, after writing drama, I was like, okay, what else can I recommend to these you know, theater kids that are reading the book and cool characters who are just normal kids that have really cool ideas. And uh, this book to me really fits the bill. Um, and Laura Lee is a really talented artist and she's uh, currently doing um, window installations uh, in New York City for Christmas time. It's, it's something that she does. And I don't know, I, I just I really like her work. And uh, so this recommended this comes recommended for me very highly. So definitely to definitely a great gift for uh, kids or like teens in your life that want to go to art school someday. You know, the, the, you know, the kids that are obviously the creative kids. Um, even if they don't like comics, I think they might get something really out of that. I think so, too. Let me say this for the chat room. Uh, for the folks who are in the chat room and watching with the Q&A app on Google+, Plus, if you guys have somebody specific in your life that you're trying to get a comic for, this is a really good panel to, uh, to you know, avail yourselves of. So if you can come up with a description of, this is the type of person I need to buy for, what should I get them? I don't know. You can, you can ask, and, and I will relay your questions during the discussion. Um, because I've got one. That I'm dipping a little bit older. Uh, this is an older book, but it's one that I think is a really good go-to for... Because like, uh, as a guy who teaches a lot of commerce classes in Ann Arbor and adult classes where I'm faced with adults who, for better or worse, still think that comics equals superheroes. There's still a lot of people in this world who think that. And they come to my comics class at the library or something, and they're like, well, so what are you going to teach me how to do like a punch scene? Like, how to do lasers? And I'm like, no, you do whatever you want. you know. And they're like, what? No, you can't. 
And so I break out Maison Ikoku by Romiko Takahashi, which is a really, really funny book. And what I love about this book is it's a sitcom. And that's how I, I pitch it to them. I say, like, look, comics can be anything. They can even be a sitcom. Because what's Maison Ikoku about? It's about a young boy who's kind of a loser. He's in college. His grades are failing. He's got, and he lives in this boarding house with these nutty neighbors who never let him study. And, the, and it's total sitcom kind of situation where the neighbors are all like you know like how in Seinfeld like Kramer like the the really or like in Too Close for Comfort remember that show anybody Monroe the guy would show up in a chicken costume sometimes it's like that kind of level of comedy sometimes and new manager comes into the boarding house to take over to taking care of the place and the boy finds out realizes in a moment that he's in love with her but he's a loser and she's a, a widower and it's a bunch of comical misunderstandings that go on for like 19 volumes or something. It's a long series, uh, but it's worth it. It's so funny and it's a, it's a rich cast of characters where uh, you, they don't need to develop because it's a sitcom again and you just come back to it for this comfort of uh, is, is uh, you know, uh, Mrs. Ichino say still going to get drunk and dance around when the kid's trying to study. Oh, there she is. She's doing it. Uh, and the development happens between the boy and the girl in the story. But uh, this is the one I would get for an adult who thinks that comics are just superheroes. Because if they watch sitcoms, if they watch broadcast television, I got a feeling they're going to like this. And it also does things that, you know, comics does best. It's not just an adaptation of a sitcom. So, um, Professor Jersey, are you saying that comics are not just superheroes? They're also manga? I guess I'm saying they're also manga. They're also <laughs> ba bande dessine. Did I say that right? <laughs> Uh, they're also manhwa. They are all those things. And yeah, Professor Jersey. Sorry. <laughs> I, I got one more that I, on the same topic. Uh, this one Anne alerted me to. Um, Tom Gauld. You guys are familiar with him, right? Oh yeah. Hunter and painter. He did a book called Goliath. Have you read this, Sharon? I, the cover looks really familiar. No, I haven't read it. So it's the story of Goliath, of David and Goliath. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> as we know, it doesn't end well <laughs> for Goliath. But, but it's, it's told from Goliath's point of view. And the, what I love about it, first of all, I love his storytelling style. Uh, it's, it's this really, um, oh, I don't know how he would even describe it, almost deadpan kind of storytelling style. And Goliath's just like an administrator for this army. He's just like a, like a bookkeeper kind of character. And then one day, like this, this uh, middle management guy gets this idea of ending the war with uh, the Israelites. And he's like, I got this great idea. I just need a sucker to put in the place of this. Oh, we got this huge guy over there who's like an administrator. We'll get him to do the job. And it's all about poor Goliath being a victim of uh, bureaucracy and, uh, and other people's machinations. And then finally ending the way it ends but it's beautifully told uh I, his style has this really awesome like i said like this understated kind of deadpan tone to it it's almost like like a, how a buster keaton movie feels if it was made in canada <laughs> that's the best <laughs> way i could describe it uh but goliath by tom gold anything tom gold does but this would be another good one for adults who think that comics are always bam pow big explosive action because because maison of coco has a lot of i would say ham-fisted humor Slapstick, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. A lot of slapstick humor and some PG-13 humor, whereas Goliath is much more, uh, you know, quieter and deadpan in its humor. And it, it, but the humor, the humor is definitely there. Uh, so Sharon, do you have, want to go to your next one? Because we got yep. man, we're already burning through this I know, time. I know. <laughs> um, well, I found I don't know. I guess I just walked along the shelves and found this one. It's called A Game for Swallows. Um, to die, to leave, to return. And the author, illustrator is Zaina Abirached. And I think this is some years old also. Um, it, the art style just caught my eye to begin with. And um, it's, it's a story of Beirut back in the 1980s when um, there was just all sorts of violence and strife going on. People literally had to try to sneak across the street to uh, get their groceries because there were snipers posted everywhere, there were bombs going off. And this, kind of like Jersey, it's a it's, um, bit of a historical piece. It's also um, a quietly told story, the, the gist of which is these two children live in an apartment building and they are alone um, at the point of the story because their parents have gone over to um, the the kid's mother's uh, mother, grand, their grandmother's house a couple blocks away, and they've been gone a while. 
um, and, and in the beginning of the book, they show that um, what their apartment originally looked like in terms of floor plan. I probably can't put my nail into exactly where that is. But because of the violence, because of the threat, um, they have narrowed down their living area to from, you know, they've moved from the bedrooms to the living room to finally the foyer or entry of the home. And that's it. It's towards the beginning. Oh, is it towards the beginning? Uh, yeah. And so the kids are in the foyer, and what you begin to, there's kind of an underlining uh, narrative it's telling about, yeah, the art is striking. It's black and white and just vivid. And the, um, the kids are there when Anhala, an older woman, comes in, and um, the neighbors tend to kind of find the foyer is a safe place. So they, she finds the kids alone, and she spends time. And eventually, other neighbors start to show up and kind of shows you the community of what it's like, you know, at this time that others are taking care of the kids um, along the way. And time is passing. And, and it, some of it sound, you know, it, it almost like, oh, is this, you know, is this all it's going to be? And then the parents come home. Well, tension begins to build because time is passing, and they can hear um, shots outside and so forth. And eventually, they they get a phone call. And about where the the paper thing is, this oh. phone call is taken by Anhala, and she's talking to the grandmother. And the grandmother, at first, the people in the in the scenes don't, you know, what what's going on? What's going on? And finally, um, she hangs up the phone, gives the children a hug, and just drawing the frame around so that it's only on hollow with the children, you know something serious is about to unfold. And that um, she quietly says, well, Ani, the grandmother, says that the children's parents have left an hour ago. And they go, an hour? And everybody knows that an hour is a long time. And where are they? What's happened? And so as you go through, you'll find eventually the res resolution of whether the parents managed to get back or not. Um, but it's, it's a, such a book of community. It's also such a book of survival, mm -hmm. of how people tried to live halfway normal lives. Um, and, and it reminds you that that's going on throughout the world at any time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's sort of a history book. It's a, it's a community book. I would say yeah, it's in our teen section. Um, it's definitely informative for a teen who realizes sometimes, you know, oh, I can't play my Nintendo, you know, <laughs> or whatever, you know, <laughs> that they have everything in their room and, and their space. But what if their space was reduced, 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 and, and they had to share it um, just to survive? You know, it's really an awesome book. And, so. and just the, a very different um, artistic style than anything I've seen. Yeah, this is very visually striking. A game for swallows. Uh, related, not related, but in the same kind of ballpark, I see that you've got March Book One. Yeah. I know Dave and Raina had that one yeah. possibly picked out, too. I wonder if you guys could talk together about because I haven't read it yet, but I I've heard lots of either. good things. Okay, March Book One. Oh, good. Go, Raina. It's good. You guys should read it. Uh, yes. I, I plan to. I <laughs> have it. I will. <laughs> so this is uh, the story of Congressman John Lewis and how he was a part of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, and he is the co-author, along with his aide in Congress, uh, Andrew Aiden, and it's drawn by Nate Powell, who's probably best known for Swallow Me Whole. Um, and it's, it's like a biopic. <laughs> I don't know if there's an equivalent for comics, but um, it's a memoir. A memoir, <laughs> sure. Um, but it's it's really well done. And I mean, I feel like the civil rights movement is something that you hear and talk about a lot in school and you learn the history of it. But to see it from somebody's point of view is completely different. And knowing that he had a huge hand in creating this story, it's it's really wonderful. And I mean, Nate Powell did a fantastic job of sort of weaving um, the present day story, which takes place on President Obama's inauguration day into uh, Congressman Lewis's past. And um, the story just kind of dovetails between those two. And so you see his childhood in Alabama, and then you see him as a young man starting to get interested in um, what's going on in his world and trying to change it. And then the book does not complete the story. This is volume one of three. Um, and it's, it's fantastic. I recommend this for both adults who um, like memoir and 
autobiography and biography, but also to, you know, young teens and, and teenagers who need to make the civil rights movement more personal. Um, it just really puts a personal stamp on the whole thing. And it's, it's really, really well done. A good book for the NPR listener in yeah. your family. <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> not, to, not to say that it's like just a book for like super liberal people, but this is a book that's actually been, uh, they, they profiled it on the Rachel Maddow show. They've shown it on Stephen Colbert. Yeah. There's a forward by Bill Clinton. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you have sort of progressive uh, liberal family members, uh, this is definitely one that they'll enjoy um, or on the opposite side <laughs> get it for your non-conservative <laughs> yeah. or your, for get, your conservative get it for your conservative members. friends who think that like racism is over and all that stuff yeah. oh yeah. Um, yeah and i this is just a side note i i've heard that the uh digital version of this book is a little bit hard to read because some of, some of the type is small uh, so if you're going to get this for somebody i recommend the paper version as opposed to the digital version well, it's um, hard to wrap a digital version and put it under the tree. <laughs> True. <laughs> well, in, in, I remember this came up when I was at that uh, comics conference in Ohio. They were talking about the, there were some problems with the digital version of the book because one of the things that uh, I can't, I think Nate Powell did is he did some interesting things with sound in the book. So, like, there'll be a crowded room and people will be muttering in the background, and then he would, like, obscure most of the text except for the things that your ear would pick up on in the room, which, as a guy who gets really nerdy about sound design and comics, I got very excited when I saw those pages. But I could see how when you reduce it down to, like, a Kindle, it might confuse some readers, especially readers who aren't used to unique sound design in comics, right? Um, but uh, I would also think that comics like that, like, I also think of, wasn't... Um, the U.S. Constitution. Yes. Uh, Jonathan Hennessy. Yeah, Jonathan Hennessy's U.S. Constitution graphic mm -hmm. novel, where he did things in that with cartoon that you couldn't do in video and you couldn't do in prose. And it was ex extremely exciting to me to see that, that, yeah, like there's a way to do history and biography in comics that is superior to other mediums, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. uh, I, I, from what I've seen of March, it looks like it does a little bit of that too. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Okay, so we got people in the chat uh, in the Q and A app saying like, "Don't recommend anything sad." Uh, so yeah. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I do the total the polar opposite? Please. Um, this is sort of like a, 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 this is a recommendation experiment, if you will, because because <laughs> like I don't. Okay, have you guys seen the Star Wars by mm -hmm. that, that uh, Dark Horse is publishing? So uh, you, as you yeah. know, Dark Horse has published hundreds of thousands of Star Wars comics. Um, but there's a new series that just started coming out called The Star Wars, as opposed to Star Wars. And it's not just like Grandpa referring it to as The Star Wars. <laughs> the it's Draculas. Yeah, so this is specifically a miniseries that is based on George Lucas's original rough draft screenplay for Star Wars. So anybody who knows who's really nerdy about Star Wars, and I bet there's somebody nerdy about Star Wars in your life, this yeah. would be a great gift for them because it takes sort of George Lucas's earliest ideas and sort of represents them in, in a way that you'll never see. So if you ever had heard or if you had seen some of the early production artwork where the characters look different and like, you know, there was a character called Anakin Starkiller as opposed to Anakin Skywalker. And what were, the, what were all these differences that sort of evolved in the process? This is a fascinating read because they basically take it as if like that movie had been made and this is the comic version of that movie. And obviously that movie will never get made. So it's really this like really cool thing that gets to exist in comics. Um, and the, to be honest, the artwork is pretty great in this. And I found myself, I bought the first issue thinking, oh my God, this is going to be horrible. Because I just thought that, you know, George Lucas, maybe his first ideas were not his best ideas. And, you know, revision, 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 and, and, and editing and all that is, what part of, is part of what made Star Wars so great. Um, but that said, it's actually kind of an enjoyable read. Um, I mean, partially because you know what it changed into. Um, but, you know, for the scholarly uh, people of the Star Wars land, um, I would say that this is a really great uh, gift and slash conversation piece um, mm. that is worth uh, checking out. And again, licensed comics. Um, yeah. What, what oh, do you get? Real what do you quick, get? if I'm going to mention yeah. another licensed comics that's actually surprisingly good, the Smurfs comics. Um, as a kid who grew up with the Smurfs and watched the cartoon show, um, I always was sort of interested in the, the, the pay, this Peo artist and what the original comics were like. Um, and they're actually really, really great comics. And um, 
the cartooning in these books are just fantastic. And some of them are very clearly based on the cartoons that you remember. And some of them are different. Um, and I think that, uh, paper, paper cuts is doing a really great job of, of bringing these over. And I know that kids really love these books. I was just, like I said, I was just at a school, uh, hanging out in a school library the other day and tons of kids kept coming in and taking these books out and reading these books and talking about these books. Um, so obviously the Smurfs are back into the echo sphere of children's lives with the movies. Um, but man, talk about like those, I can't, you can't pay me to watch those movies, but these, <laughs> but these comics are really a lot of fun. Well, and, and I would even submit that the comics are, uh, are superior to the original Hanna-Barbera cartoons as yeah, good as they those are. are. Uh, related to yours, I'll, I'll pitch right back, uh, in the Donald Duck, Carl oh, Barks yes. series. Oh, love those books. Uh, and this is, again, good for adults and kids because any of us who grew up on – adults these days who grew up on DuckTales by any chance, which was more Scrooge McDuck, but it was based on Carl Barks' world that he, that he built. Uh, oh, my gosh, these Donald Duck comics are so much fun. And they, there is a Scrooge McDuck collection out too, but there's a few volumes of this series. And it's Donald Duck and his three nephews going on – Crazy adventures, and the first one is Lost in the Andes, where they go into the Andes Mountains and find this ancient civilization where they have square eggs, and what's the deal with the square eggs? Oh, they're very valuable. we got to get, got to take one and get one home, and there's all these hijinks, only to get them home and realize that there's something wrong with the square eggs after all. Uh, but it's fantastic cartooning, super, super fun. Um, again, like I said, if you, if you watch DuckTales and enjoyed it, you will really, really, really love these comics, these and the, the Scrooge McDuck ones. And those uh, book, all the fanographics... Uh... Disney collections are really great gifts because they're beautiful books in that sort of classic coffee table book kind of way yeah. where you want to unwrap something and hold something in your hands and really have a testament to why print is still completely valuable. Um, those, those, those Disney books that Fanographics are doing, as well as the Peanuts books and all the other books that Fanographics put out, um, they're so beautifully designed. The paper stock is great. The binding is great. Um, the Mickey Mouse comic strip collections by Floyd Godgerson are so those things are a, re a revelation yeah. because you hear about Carl Barks and what a genius he was, but there were actually quite a few artists back then that were doing amazing comics work with those characters. And yeah, we, uh, Ann and I got that Mickey Mouse collection and it's surprising to see how different <laughs> Mickey is. Yeah. He's those... a real adventurer and the, the, yeah. the, the, the thrills are, are really exciting and the daring do is really uh flamboyant. And man, some of the panels in that first, the scene where Donald Duck first gets to the Andes and he's like, there's like a crane shot where they're like looking over the city. Yeah, I'll try to find it. It's just it. unbelievable. Well, and you get to meet his, uh, is it his cousin or his, who's, who's the, the, the lucky one? Uh, yeah, his lucky cousin who always, everything works out for him every time. Yeah, that's uh, a great story. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I, I see if we can get a shot of this. But like, yeah, some of Carl Barks's spreads and layouts and some of his art itself is just, just fantastic, just gorgeous. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, recognizable characters, but also really beautiful treatment of the material. So this feels like you didn't just get them like a paperback at Barnes and Noble. You got them like a really nice thing that they're supposed to treasure. Um, okay, we both own this one. Yes, right? we got to talk about this. Ariel. Ariel. Um, let's see, Ariel, just a donkey like you and me, and uh, give people a possible gift that comes from. Um, Europe. It's it's a cool story by Emmanuel Gibert and Marc Boutevant, which I'm probably butchering their pronunciations, but um, it's a wonderful story about Ariel, who's a little blue donkey. All the characters are animals, and they, they pretty much contain or, or retain, I should say, their animalness, even though they speak and they go to school and they do all the things that kids do. And, and it's a wonder, there's just all these fun episodes of Ariel and his best friend Piggy, and um, he's got a crush on um, a little heifer, and it's just, <laughs> I, I, it's hard to describe. You have to just absorb the, the little story. I it's would wonderful. say, I would say it's got the same kind of uh, tone as, the, well, here we are in the holidays, uh, A Christmas Story, that uh -huh. movie about Ralphie. Uh, yes. It's like that. It's like about little kids doing kids things, but it's told in a way that is uh, fun for adults to read and I think relatable to kids. 
Um, yeah, and he's also got a hero named Thunder Horse who he w wants to be like. He wants to be more like Thunder Horse, and he talks about Thunder Horse all the time. But then eventually, Thunder Horse starts showing up in his dreams and interacting with him, and mm -hmm. it's so funny. It is so. Funny. Have you guys read it, Dave and Raina? Have you read Ariel yet? No. I feel so bad. I want to read it. And when I was in when we were in France, we saw it all over there because it's actually French comics yeah. that have been translated. Um, they look wonderful. I know that I'll love them. I just I haven't yeah. had a chance to pick one up yet. You guys read a lot of comics all year. But, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, Ariel, actually, we picked it up at Little Island Comics when we were uh, out in Toronto. Uh, that's the name of the store, right? Yeah. Uh, and we, Anne saw it on the shelf, and all she had to do was see the cover. <laughs> 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 it was like, I'll take it home, please. And then she wound up absolutely loving it, and we just got the second volume. Uh, but, yeah, it's Very a fantastic cool. book for Anybody who loves sweetness and joy. Um, um, I'm just going to throw up this one yeah. really fast again. This uh, We had Joshua Hawk at the Kid 3 Comics. And anybody who remembers My Three Sons from uh, Days of Yore on television, this is um, a wonderful set of stories about three brothers. Very distinct personalities. There's the older brother who's cool, wears his vest and tie all the time, and the middle brother who doesn't have a place that fits, and the get little brother Dougie, and um, the things that they get into so much reminds me of, like I would give it to my nephews. I have um, four nephews. The two middle guys are um, twins, and even though they're pretty much 18 through 20, whatever, uh, <laughs> I lose track now. They would appreciate something like this, even though I'm sure it's sort of a kid's comic. Um, it's it's for any parent, any kid, any grown-up who has had those wonderful adventures growing up with siblings. Uh, the Brothers Three. Okay, we're, we're coming up on the, 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 the bottom of the Yeah, I know, I know. I know. So, okay, let's do lightning round. Let's just like, pick a book and name the person it's for. How about that? Ah. Title and then who it's for. Like, for instance, I think we all have this book in our piles. Oh. Uh, Delilah Dirk of the Turkish Lieutenant by Tony Cliff. Yes. This is for the person who loves Indiana Jones in your life. There you go. Okay. Um, Gunnar Craig Court. I just picked up this third volume. It's a great series, and it's for a person who maybe was a Harry Potter reader, and but this is oh so different. <laughs> okay. Dave? Um, another great book for the Harry Potter reader. Um, the Courtney Crummerin series by Ted Naif Naifey. 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 Ted Naifey. <laughs> I should know that because we spent a couple of weeks hanging out with him uh, during Raina's tour in Paris. Um, the hardcover editions uh, are so gorgeous. These are another really beautifully produced books in full color for the first time. Great object. Um, really spooky and scary and adventure and great characters. Um, yes. Raina. Okay, lightning round. I'm going to recommend Relish by yes. Lucy Nisley. Um, someone described this as for the kids who have outgrown smile, which at first, <laughs> <laughs> at first I was like, what? No one outgrows my books. But then I realized, well, but you get older and you get to be a teenager and you, <laughs> um, and yeah. so this is good for, um, I, it's sort of like a, a YA slash new adult book in that it's, it's coming from an older person's point of view, but is looking back on their childhood and it's all stories related to her love of food. So anybody who's a foodie. Um, it's good for mothers also because it does talk a lot about sort of this mother-daughter relationship between Lucy and her mother. Her mother is a caterer, so it's it's really cool. It's if you like memoir, if you like food, if you like really well drawn stories. Here you go, and it has recipes too. And it has recipes and too. Thank recipes. you, Jared. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Uh, Ms. Library Worker in the chat is suggesting uh, Bluffton by Matt Phelan for the person who loves mm -hmm. history and Matt the history Phelan. of film. Yeah, uh, I'm excited to read that. Yeah, Bluffton is the story of Buster Keaton and his vaudeville days, and so yeah, yeah, uh, definitely check that out. Uh, if you have a cat lover in your life, if you have somebody who just loves their cats a lot, geez, sweet home. Enough said. That's all I just go get it, look at it. You'll give it to the person in your life who loves cats. If you have a cat hater in your life, how about <laughs> Bird and Squirrel by James Burks? Just kidding. The cat is the villain um, <laughs> because Bird and Squirrel are the two main characters, and they are trying to uh, get away for the winter. For the fans of Spongebob and, and Nickelodeon yes. cartoons. Mm -hmm. I'd say, like, your second-grade nephew. Okay. This is the book to get him. Okay. okay, if you're Walking Dead fans and, like, zombie lovers, all your teens that love zombies and zombie video games, Daybreak by Brian Ralph, the whole book, you are, it's, you are a character in the book, and the main character is talking to you, and you have to survive a zombie apocalypse. You're trapped in this, like, shed, and there's zombies at the door, and you guys have to fend them off together. 
as a team. It's really awesome. Brian Ralph, Daybreak. Um, I've got Bad Houses by Sarah Ryan. And oh. Yeah, <laughs> and Carla Speed McNeil. And I just finished this last night. I don't even know exactly who it's for, except that it's got the best character development, whether it's teen, adult, and it's... Um, a small town, small town community, and, and what happens if you stay longer than you should or you don't pursue those dreams or, and more than anything else, I love the estate sales and how um, Sarah was so fascinated and brought this story to life with the fact that, you know, there's oftentimes yard sales where people give up stuff as they go through life, but it's the estate sale that you meet up with what the person held on to the, to the very end. Mm. Uh, if you have somebody in your life who is failing in their mythology tests, they, they don't care for mythology, or they really, really love mythology, uh, and whether an adult or a child, George O'Connor's uh, Olympian series brings the stories of Greek mythology to life. He's been on the show before, uh, basically playing Greek mythology like straight up superhero comics. I think that was your description, Dave. Uh, and Yeah, and I'll just vouch real quick that I spend a lot of times in schools, and I see kids going nuts for those books. Kids eat those books up. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're really good. Okay, any others? Okay, um, for yeah. young kids and uh, people who like fairy tales, how about fairy tale comics published by First Second Books, edited by Chris Duffy, follow up to Nursery Rhymes Comics. Um, it's all short stories. It's got a story by me. I did a Rapunzel story for this book. Um, it's got a cool uh, three Goldilocks and the Three Bears story by Graham Animal. It's got... Um, uh, 12 Dancing Princesses by Emily Carroll, and it has Little Red Riding Hood by Gigi DG, who's freaking amazing, and Dave's going to tag team with this. So Gigi DG, amazing web cartoonist. She does a series called Cucumber Quest, which this is definitely the book for the Disney fans. If you grew up loving Disney animated movies, and especially the fairy tale ones, and the modern ones, because this one has sort of the same sense of humor as Rapunzel and Frozen, um, Cucumber Quest, Gorgeous, gorgeous book. Espe animation fans, I think, would go like mouthwatery for this book. She's the really colors. inspired by uh, Mario. Also. Yeah, she looks yeah very video game yeah. Uh, centric as well. Love it. Cucumber Quest. Okay. You want to go? Is it my turn? Okay. Uh, so if you have a fan of the Ghostbusters in your life and zombie movies, I would recommend Mark Mariano's Flabbergast, which is basically about a bunch of Power Rangers-esque ghost hunters who get trapped in a house full of zombies, and it is totally accessible to, I would say, an 11-year-old and up, uh, but it's super bright and fun. Um, I'll piggyback, piggyback with that with Tune, and I have volume two here, Still Life, and this is a story about a kid who can't quite figure out what he is going to do with his life. He's an art major, um, but quits art school and ends up, got to get a job. His parents are leaning hard on him, got to get a job, got to get a job, and he does. It becomes a live exhibit in an alien world and volume two he's about to find out what that exactly means mm. i got one more uh friend of of Derek kirk kim uh tin fam who's been on the show before this is for the person uh is the 17 year old in your life who's graduating high school and they don't know what they're going to do with their lives yet that's all i'm mm -hmm. going to say and it has sumo wrestling in it but it is a very heartfelt and poignant book and it, i definitely recommend it to every 17 year old in the world all right all right, for the smart-ass teen or preteen in your life, I'm going to go back a few years to Squee by Jonan Vasquez. This book is like a modern classic. All of Jonan's books are. Um, this is for the, you know, the goth kids, for the smart-ass kids, for the humor kids. If kids like Adventure Time, all that stuff, they'll love this. The kids are playing Minecraft all day um, and like humorous videos on the Internet. Squee is definitely for them. I love the fact that he doodles like crazy, and then there's all these jokes in the margin. It's exactly like this book predated, you know, the sense of humor that kids have now. Um, and it's like really edgy and violent and all the stuff that teenagers love. Okay. Uh, one more? Yep, one more. <laughs> Let's go with Boxers and Saints. Uh, Team Liu and Yang. Yeah. Double set is the way to go. Um, you can't <laughs> read these two books uh, apart from one another. You got to read Boxers first and then Saints right after it. And you will because you'll be gripped. Um, two points of view on the same story. It's about the Boxer re Rebellion. I always want to call it the Boxer Revolution in China. Um, historical fiction. You've got one character who's part of the rebellion and he um, fights with the force of many Chinese gods behind him. And then the other story is told from the point of view of a girl who converts to Catholicism, 
during the rebellion and has uh, Joan of Arc as her sort of mental guiding spirit. And ah, <laughs> we didn't lose you. Good. No. Her window just cut out. Um, yeah. So this is this is for scholars. This is for teenagers. This is for my dad, probably, wow. is who I'll send this one to. Uh, and it's also beautiful packaging. It is beautifully drawn. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Gene's amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. Gene, yeah, he is. And then uh, one more that I throw in on the bottom end is Astronaut Academy reentry. Yeah. I just reread right. it. I just reread it for the fourth time, and I was I, I can't believe how many times you can read this and still be caught off guard by something emotionally sweet. Dave is going to hit you in the face with sweetness like a Rankin Bass special. But uh, it's also for anybody who ever uh, loved video games. Loved if you were the kid in school who when you were in elementary school who had feelings and maybe got in a little <laughs> bit of trouble for having feelings uh definitely resonated with me and i mean the, the the way the kids solve the problem in the end is so sweet and so beautiful and there's this whole part in the middle where uh there's a monster eating the kid's heart the kid by, by the way real fast kids all have multiple hearts just like in a video game you're playing legend of zelda you got multiple hearts and you don't want to lose all your hearts you die uh and you can also give hearts to one another to express affection like i love you very much here have a heart right well this monster shows up and it can eat the kid's hearts very scary and so what's the solution to the problem don't give your hearts away don't love hide your feelings right repress yourselves children after all it's the only way you're gonna stay stay uh, stay safe and the way they solve the problem is really beautiful. And it's a wonderful message to send to kids, Dave. Uh, not enough people, in my opinion, are talking about this book. So that's why I keep showing it to people. Uh, Ast Astronaut Academy, reentry. Beautiful, and I, beautiful. And I think it's a beautiful book to give at this time of year, too. I definitely agree. Mm -hmm. The way, Especially the way it ends. It's definitely, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's, it's not specifically holiday themed, but the spirit of the holidays is in that book. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, thanks, Jersey. Well, I will give a self-plug, sort of. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, no, Means like sort of. spread out. Um, so I did a story in the Explorer book, The Lost Islands. Raina and I collaborated on a story together, but it's got a ton of our friends, Jake Parker, Michelle Gagne, Jason Cafo, Katie Shanahan, Stephen Shanahan, her brother, um, an amazing artist named Kristen Garland who has never done a comic before, but you have to read this book just to see her comic. Um, and of course, Kazuki Buishu of the Amulet series, he's the editor on this, did a brilliant, brilliant story. Um, these are books I don't think enough people are paying attention to. Great, Stop. great anthology, and I'm shaking it. <laughs> yeah, yeah hold it still. <laughs> Stop shaking it. Uh, this is the follow-up to Explore the Mystery Boxes, which we also have a piece in, and they're both published by Abrams Amulet. All right, now one more plug. I'm yeah. feeling it. <laughs> Seen But Not Heard by Sam Henderson. This is a collection of comics from Nickelodeon Magazine. Everyone, please remember Nickelodeon Magazine. It was good times. <laughs> R.I.P. Um, rest in peace. Seen but not heard. Silent Comics by Sam Henderson. Also for the kids who love to doodle in their notebooks. Um, great. Okay, well, here's how we're going to close. Uh, <laughs> Dave shot some video of what it would look like if you made a uh, comics lover in your life happy this holiday season. And while Matt pulls that video up, I want to hear from you guys especially from you and uh, Dave Marina, uh, not comics now, but TV. What are the killer holiday uh, specials that people need to watch with oh. popcorn and the, 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 the furnace on and the, the warm lights on the tree? Uh, top picks for holiday specials this year. How many are we allowed to... No, I'm just kidding. And Matt, you can play um, the video while we talk about it. I'll, uh, the one that comes to mind for me is uh, Rankin Bass's Twas the Night Before Christmas, which is <laughs> animated in 2D as opposed to stop motion. Right. Um, and it's about the little mouse family who wasn't stirring. Um, and, and the songs from that show were like such crazy earworms that I just adore. Um, and it's really nicely done. Not a special, but it's a recent movie uh, produced by Aardman Animations, best known for the Wallace and Gromit series, is Arthur Christmas. Arthur it's, a, Christmas. it's a full length feature film. Uh, it's in CGI rather than clay, but it is so heartwarming and hilarious and does everything that Christmas movies need to do. Um, did it, not get enough love. Did not get enough Such love. Such a good movie. Um, that's the one that I recommend uh, the most lately. Um, we talked about the Muppet Family Christmas uh, on Saturday Supercast. That, that'll a, be dropping soon, yep. Uh, that'll be dropping soon. Um, that's the best of all the Muppet Christmas things, and the Muppets have made a lot of Christmas things over the years. <laughs> Yeah, um, so if you, people want to check that out at uh, saturdaysupercast.tumblr.com because uh, that has me and Dave and Raina and Zach Gilongo talking about Muppet Family Christmas. Yeah. 
Yeah, my favorite uh, of the semi-Christmas specials that does not get enough love is Jack Frost. Not the Michael Keaton one, Greg Shegel, <laughs> but the real one uh, that Rankin Bass produced. It's sort of like a love story between this sort of mass. Uh, it, and, and it's, you know, if people are like, oh, I like the Jack Frost in the, the DreamWorks Rise of the Guardians movie. This is sort of like that character. Um, first like they did it they did it first it's a it's a great romance story between someone who's like sort of an immortal and a mortal woman and how he basically bec- jack frost becomes a human to try to get this girl to fall in love with him and convince the gods that he you know that it's okay for him to be a human um it's a beautiful story it's really funny some of the best puppet animation that rankin bass ever did some of the best models <laughs> it's got these steampunk horses that are worth it just to watch it just for that canuck 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 and all the knights yeah uh, Nights on horses. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Well, and the bad guy is really great in it too, and he's yeah. played by Paul Frees. And one of the best lines on the thing is "Canuck, Canuck, Canuck, you're fired." He says to them as they're falling to their deaths. <laughs> 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 that is a great special. Sharon, do you have a pick? What What do you put on oh, every holiday season? Oh my gosh, I love whatever the 1950s version of uh, Scrooge of Charles the Dickens. The 50s one. Oh yeah, before mm. you dot another uh you know, dot mm. another eye Bob Cratchit. You know, yeah. I mean it's like I just love that particular Scrooge. It's a black and white, it's just one that I have to see every year. See, mine is the nineteen seventies musical with Albert Finney. Like I can't get enough of okay, that. Okay, I saw that right after finals in college. <laughs> and it was delightful, I admit, but you know, it's like it's tied to it's that. What, whatever you kind of be, you know, start out with, I think. Well, so, yeah, whatever I, you're whatever. I have a fondness for the Bill Murray Scrooge. I know it's like not exactly the most faithful edition, but it's actually <laughs> yeah. really like it gets to the heart of the story in a really great way, I thought. Yeah, sure. it does. I it's just I, I've yet to see a Ghost of Christmas present done better than the Albert Finney Scrooge, like the big hairy chested giant voiced guy that's totally my favorite favorite of all of dickens characters but uh but any christmas carol right even the muppet christmas carol um i love mickey's christmas carol mickey's christmas carol that's a good mm-hmm. one too right mm-hmm. is that the first time we meet uncle scrooge as a it, duck character? maybe the is the first time he appeared in animation possibly oh maybe i don't know i don't know my history we'll have to research that Okay, well... The comics definitely predate that. The, the Uncle Scrooge comics Okay. earlier. I wasn't sure what year the Mickey's Christmas Carol came out. I think it's 81. Uh, really? So. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of oh. late. Oh, oh I, yeah. yeah, I had it in my head that it was like the 50s or something. It feels oh. like a classic. It's yeah. a, this bridge between like the last of the like Disney films and then before like their renaissance with Little Mermaid and Rescuers Down mm-hmm. Under. Oh, wow. Uh, okay, well... <laughs> If you can believe it, that was over an hour that we just did. Uh, and I can't thank you guys enough for hanging out with me and talking about all these great comics uh, to fill up everybody's wish lists. There'll be more links to things that we talked about and links to other people's wish lists. Faith Aaron Hicks did a great write-up on uh, what she would recommend for mm-hmm. uh, Holly Season and Faith Aaron Hicks of... Uh... Yeah, which I apologize, Faith. <laughs> Nothing I, could possibly not... go wrong. Yeah, I love this book, but yes, I'm sorry. that Also that for somebody who, who uh, thinks that comics are just superheroes because this is about a bunch of kids who put on, yeah. uh, you know, making robots. Robot com- competition. Robot yeah. competition. And not punching robots, but like real, you know, like mm-hmm. robots with saws on the back and then tank treads like they make in real life. So, uh, yeah, Faith is great. And, uh, but we'll, we'll link to things like that, more different lists. Uh, and then also the Kids Comics Revolution Awards is a good go-to list for mm-hmm. things, books to get for kids. Okay. Dave, Reina, Merry Christmas to you guys. Merry Xmas. <laughs> uh, anything that you guys wanted to point out that I didn't mention? I want to give you guys the final word on this. Um, no, I, I just think that... I'll point at him. I hope that everybody uh, <laughs> takes our advice to heart and goes out and gets some great comics. Uh, share the love of comics with people and, you know, make the world a better place. That's, that's what like you... Like that can... Coke commercial. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what you can get me for the holidays. And then, I don't know, am, am I allowed to say that this yeah. is your last show? Yeah, Sharon? Yeah, um, you're allowed. Okay. Well, well oh, bye, Sharon. Sharon. Uh, yes, I'm now, retiring. Well, Sorry. In, a, in, a, in, a, in a very real sense, uh, the comics stuff that we've done in this town wouldn't have happened the way it did without you. You know, and I've said before, and I've joked yeah. around, you know, you're the comics don. Uh, but but I, I you know it, it was based in sincerity. You, you seven years ago you said hey we should do some comics workshops in this town in this library and you didn't know what was going to happen out of that. But now we're doing kids read comics. Now we got the comics forum. Uh, 
you know. Can I can I plug the January fifth comic <laughs> artist forum? Yes, it's with Jay Foskett, who uh, who was did Yeoman's work in twenty thirteen and produced four different volumes of the Bodhi Troll Adventures, and he's going to come and share what that was like. James Foskett is an amazingly talented cartoonist, yeah, and that's yeah. awesome. Uh, yeah. First Sunday of every month we have the yep. comics forum, yep. but uh, look at Sharon being humble and deflecting she all that does. Right. by turning it on to turning it to the to the next project. That's the way she always does it, too. And, and that's what we wanted, ADL. <laughs> <laughs> it's very He-Man of you, because He-Man always says, you know, thank you, Your Majesty. I'm just glad nobody got hurt. And then he bounds away on Battle Cat. You know, he never sticks around to get the parade. Uh, but, but no. I want to see Sharon jump on Battle Cat. And <laughs> <laughs> Please. I don't know. That could be tough these days. <laughs> Yeah, well, but I'm thank sure you. Cats long retired. Yeah. I'm, I'm, on behalf of everybody who's participated in all the comics events in Ann Arbor, I mean, we've seen people like Stephanie Mannheim come through these mm -hmm. corridors and go on to do really, really cool things. And that's because of you. And on behalf of everybody, thank you so much for everything oh, sure. you did. Sure. And, I'm, and I'm, I won't go away. I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> I really don't. I really hope I'll not. I'll be haunting you all. <laughs> <laughs> Strike her down. <laughs> <laughs> But this will be your last time on Comics Are Great, and that, right. that is that is heartbreaking to me. But it, you, you knew the day would come. But uh, unless I make my own comic, right? I would love that I so know, much. I know you would just fall over. I have you? been pushing on you for seven years <laughs> that you could do this. Yes, for crying out loud! Now that you're retiring, you could write your book, The Great American Graphic yeah, Novel. Who there better? You go. Oh my gosh, you got so many cartoonists who love you who would promote the heck out of it. I so know. you're sitting on a gold mine, Sharon. <laughs> uh, okay, well, thank you everybody for participating, downloading, listening, and watching. This show will be archived at comicsaregreat.com slash CAG91. Uh, if you liked what you heard, you could go to iTunes and give the show a star review, however many stars you think it deserves. You can uh, give the video a thumbs up on YouTube. You can also check out the other shows that uh, Dave and I do, uh, the Saturday Supercast at saturdaysupercast.tumblr.com, and then also Kids Comics Revolution at kidscomicsrevolution.com, where all we do is do talking about kids' comics that we're really excited about and talk with some of the creators of those books. So it's totally reader's advisory. Uh, and also we have re book talks by librarians and kids on the show, which is really, really cool. So, uh, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Th uh, thanks, thanks again, Dave and Raina. Thank you once again, Sharon. And uh, until next time, everybody, uh, happy new year. Um, happy holidays. I've been Jersey Droz of comicsagreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye. <laughs>